Hi, my name is Yasmin Terehi, and this is Startup Confessionals, where we interview startup founders and entrepreneurs in the Middle East and Africa. We'll learn about some of the biggest lessons these founders discovered on their journey from the personal to the professional and share how they keep themselves motivated. Today's episode is with Badr Ward, the instigator of the edtech industry for children across the Middle East and North Africa and the founder of LAMSA, which we will dive into today. Led by the latest in early childhood development research and education technology, LAMSA is the essential learning companion in every child's development years, laying the foundation for lifelong development and success. And on account of his vast and diverse knowledge, Ward was selected by the World Economic Forum as the member of the Global Future Council and serves as an advisory board member at the Emirates College of Technology. I am so excited to welcome Bedr to the show. So welcome to Startup Confessionals. Thank you, Yasmin. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so Bedr, can you talk to us about the value proposition of LAMSA? I know that I spoke about it in the intro, but I'd love to hear how you talk about your own value proposition in your own words. I really founded uh, LAMSA Yasmin because I believe that education changes lives. And I wanted to enable my own children to reach their full potential. You see, the early years really matter. And the foundations of lifelong learning, health, and behavior are all laid down in uh, early childhood. So when we established LAMSA in about 2013, Um, The real objective was, how do we build those beautiful minds? How do we unlock potential across the Arab world? How do we give children the best start to their early learning journeys? Because we believe every child deserves equal chance and equal access to high quality education. And so the, the main value proposition of LEMSA is that it's an app that helps children develop in the formative years. Early childhood is categorized as between the ages of two to eight. And we focus a lot on future skills, future knowledge, and how do we develop children's brain and their brain architecture to enable them and unlock their full potential. I love that so much. And Bader, I believe that you also attended, I think it was Montessori School in the Middle East. Um, Is that correct? And how did that also empower your own journey or how did that inspire your own journey when it came to creating this education platform? Yeah, I did. And in fact, my mother was uh, one of the first Montessori teachers uh, across uh, the Arab world. And so we had... uh, Grown up at home with a Montessori system, and she, I also, she, she taught me for a while uh, in school. Uh, it's very interesting to have your mom as the, as your teacher as well. Um, so yeah, uh, the focus on early childhood development really shaped up myself and my brothers and my sister, and was part of our family. Um, w- when it comes to Lamsa, we we really try to take the essence of. Uh, the personalization that that happens in a Montessori classroom, whereby you have a few adults uh, looking at how every child is individually progressing, and we we take that and try to develop it um, on scale for for parents across the world to have access to high quality education that is personalized um, to the unique needs. Uh, and progress of every child. So yes, uh, Maria Monsori has played a, a, a big role and uh, influence, had had a great influence on, on everything that we do. Wow. So uh, Bader, how did the first version of the product evolve and change to what it is today? Can you walk us through that journey? Because I think a lot of times people who see successful companies, they often assume that 
you know, that the success was easy or that the road was easy. And I know you've been in this for now a number of years. So I'd love to hear from you, like, what was that journey like? And can you walk us through some of the decisions that you made, maybe like feedback loops that you encountered um, while building the product, uh, especially since you've, you know, targeted this, this age group of, I think it's like two to eight. Um, so yeah, can you walk us through how it changed from version one to where it is today? So it it hasn't been easy at all. <laughs> so this is a confessional, so we, you know we get a get it all out there. So it hasn't been easy. I remember the first version was simply um, a very basic interactive screen, and we were sitting in the office, so excited about you know touching elements on the screen and having a ball jump or something like that. It was also early days when when Steve Jobs had just you know um, decided not to support Flash going forward and uh, gave birth to HTML5 as we know it now. So from a tech perspective, um, we we really decided to experiment very early on with uh, new technologies at that time, such as HTML5. And uh, if I compare Lamsa from you know looking at it now and 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 the first version that came out. <laughs> Uh, it's actually quite funny. Uh, it was very basic, too basic. Um, and, you know, we proved the concept very quickly. We we got the tech to support what we were trying to do and the experience that we were trying to achieve. Um, but then we had to build content uh, and that wasn't easy. So we, we kind of uh, picked up on the the children's literature uh, uh, space. So I was uh, inspired, you know, one of my favorite books of all time is The Very Hungry Caterpillar <laughs> uh, of Eric Carle. And so I was always fascinated by, by the work of Eric Carle and children's literature. And I attended a few museums growing up. And it, it, it's it's a vast world of, of, of creativity and imagination. And if you think about it, Yasmin, it's the first... Um, the first avenue to explore the world after spending a few months with, with your mother, right? right? So each of us spends a few months with our mother. And then the first things that parents do is they go to the bookshop and get a few books. And that's, you know, from, from the point of view of a child, that's their first experience um, looking at things outside of their house or, the, the, you know, that, that cozy environment. So picture books, um, allow them to travel to different places, see new things. And I was fascinated by that. And I said, you know, can we bring that to, to, to the digital world where we're seeing massive adoption of, of these technologies and enable them in such a way that it, it feels very intuitive and interactive and very engaging to children. Um, and so building the first book was, I would say, the most challenging um, experience because when we commissioned artists and animators and few talents uh, you know it wasn't like we were copying something nothing as such existed so we wanted to create something that that no one knew what 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 it looked like when it was developed and so it was yeah lots of experimentation lots of fun lots of back and forth um Sometimes we drew things that looked really beautiful, but then did not work on technology. It was, you know, too much for 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 the tech to handle. Sometimes, you know, we we, we forget to add music elements. We forget. So there was so many different learnings and experimentation. And there wasn't a school or, or a university that would teach us how to build interactive media design uh, that combines education, creativity, technology, uh, all in, in one place to deliver an exciting educational experience. Uh, but what we really did well was listen to our customers. And I think that helped us to understand what we should do more of and what we should do less of. So it's been a lot of experimentation, Yasmin. And I would say until now, um, testing and experimentation with children and parents um, is a very important function at LEMSA. And better, how did you uh, get the 
like, how did you know that you had product market fit at, you know, cause it seems like you hired a number of content creators and the product evolved and got to a, a place where there was interactive media. So like, at what point in the journey did you feel like, okay, we definitely got this right. Or we definitely have, um, created a product that the market absolutely needs. And we have this competitive advantage. Like do you, what was that? Was there like kind of a, a switch that went off, um, at a particular version of the product or was it kind of just evolving all the time? What, what's been your experience? I think, um, we continuously learn, uh, about our customers, about our market, but it was very clear from very early days. And I remember, uh, probably the second or third uh, release of Lamsa um, hit the top market charts. So we were kind of like, you know, in the kids category, we achieved, you know, first and second ranks across multiple markets. Um, and that was like an aha moment. It did not mean that we had a great product then, but what we were able to quickly validate and identify was that, you know, the, the brand and the value proposition and our communication really worked with parents. And that gave us a lot of motivation to continue to build better experiences. And I think uh, ever since then, we've been very lucky to be um, trusted by parents, loved by kids, and maintain a very you know high ranking position on the app stores and you know, and, and word of mouth has been great. Uh, but it took us a while to figure out how do we create that balance between, you know, the two different users that we have. So from one side, you've got children that are the primary users that engage on the platform, that interact with our content, that love what we do. But then the parents play a very active role in downloading the app for young children and activating, activating an account and subscribing, right? Using a payment method. And so it took us a while, honestly, to, to figure out that balance. I remember the first year we were so focused on parents, we kind of forgot uh, that children have an <laughs> active role in, in this uh, you know, experience. And then the second year, as we matured and evoluted, we were like, oh yeah, we need to go all out with children. And then we started focusing on children and then we forgot the parents. And I think as we matured and uh, evoluted with time, we realized that we need to build for both. And you know, ever since then, we've been working with uh, two distinct objectives. Uh, one being parents should trust LAMSA and kids should love it. Mm. And, and they're two very different things. And therefore we've got strategies and features that deliver on both these objectives simultaneously. And I think that's, you know, that took us a while to figure out, but once we got that combination uh, and balance in place, it just allowed us to move much faster and enhance everything across, you know, the brand, the platform, the options, the features, uh, while getting constant feedback, uh, but it, it you know development doesn't stop. You see, even throughout COVID, and um, you know, parents and children are at the core of everything that we do. So we've always been able to pick up on existing pain points and you know trends and insights on where things are going forward. Uh, and I think just being close to to our audience has has really uh, been very useful for us. Yeah, I, I want to also double click on this point that you're making because a lot of times when folks are building product, they only focus and think about the end user, right? And in this case, the end user is are the children, um, but forget about the decision makers and the influencers. Uh, in this case, the parents. So um, I love that you guys have figured that out and you have a strategy for both uh, customers essentially because they're they are both your customers. So it's a super important point that I think a lot of companies miss. And even from an ecosystem perspective, right? There's a lot of people influencing the the decisions, um, you know, towards purchase. So it's not just the end users. And I, I really think that I just wanted to highlight that point. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the financing piece because creating a company is, 
it's hard and difficult and expensive, especially when you're hiring folks like uh, content creators, right, on your end. So how were you able to raise money and what was that process like for you? How did your priority shift and change as you evolved the product? Um, did you start out bootstrapping? What was your experience? Yeah, it's, you know, fundraising um, at the time when we started Lamsa, uh, the early days was not easy because the entire VC ecosystem was was also very new. Um, so we were both new. Lamsa was new and, and, and the VC uh, ecosystem was new. Um, we started off by bootstrapping. Uh, but one of the things that we got really lucky with was our ability to monetize and generate revenue quite quickly. So I come from a subscription background uh, where, you know, I, I really love subscriptions and I believe it's one of the sustainable models out there in the direct to consumer businesses. And so from day one, we launched Lamsa with a subscription method. It's not easy because we also had to build the infrastructure for, 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 for the payment and the subscriptions. And so um, this was prior to even Apple or Google launching their in-app subscription methods. So we had to find alternative methods that were not so popular. Uh, you know, we had to experiment with, with, with some ecosystem players. And so I think the fact that we were there, we were lucky, we were on the ground, enabled us to um, enable subscriptions and get revenue and then go back to the few VCs that were present at that time and say, you know, in just a few months of, of, of launching this product, not only did we achieve a, a good amount of downloads and engagement, uh, but we also were able to demonstrate that the product is monetizable. And I think that, um, that, that worked well for us. And, and, and so we were able to get uh, our first check from uh, a VC in the region um, during, I think, the first few months. And 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 from there onwards, just been uh, a constant uh, a journey of, of growing and learning together with the development of the of the VC ecosystem in, in, across the region. And I think now um, it's much different. Uh, there are many options. Um, there are specialized uh, investors that do specific verticals. And I think this is uh, of high value to any startup that's uh, working on something that's uh, uh, quite, you know, uh, focused is, is the ability to attract capital from an investor that has know-how and can add value and expertise, uh, you know, in a specific domain. And I think the ecosystem is developing very quickly as we speak. Yeah, it's so fascinating. I uh, so we spoke to May uh, Medhat, who's the founder of um, or co-founder of Aventus. Um, I think it was a couple. Oh, May is great. Yeah, she's one of my favorite founders. <laughs> yeah, well, she also created a company when the kind of VC ecosystem had not been as as developed as it is today. And so I love hearing this, these stories of of how difficult it was in the beginning. Um, and you know, today it seems not e well, I guess easier because there is more of a development of the the VC model. And like you're saying, there's um, folks who have like strategic vertical focus. Um, so that's, yeah, just very interesting to hear about the folks who've been in this game for so long. <laughs> but to be fair, Yasmin, I think it's also uh, works the other way around. So um, it's much more competitive now and startups now need to demonstrate a high degree of, of um, let's say, uh, gameplay and, and figuring out all their things before going to VCs. At the time when we started, because the VCs were limited and, and developing across the region, startups were also very limited. So to be fair, um, it, was, it was also a different dynamics where there weren't many, as many startups as there are today. And so if you were able to get the attention of one of the top or one of the few VCs that that, that existed then, uh, you probably had a better chance of, of raising than today because from those VCs, because 
uh, the, you know, just the supply and demand, there weren't as many startups back then. So the odds were, 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 were with you rather than against you today. Um, yes, there are uh, uh, many, many more VCs, but there are also uh, lots of startups out there. So only the real, real good ones get funded today. Mm. in nor- in normal circumstances. So just just out of fairness I had to say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh thanks for that context. Yeah, it makes sense. Um better I want to talk about the moments of adversity that you faced on this journey. I mean, you spoke about how that it was not easy when you first started, but because this is a confessional show, I want to dig into what you thought you sacrificed um, to start the company and how you deal with those moments of difficulties, whether it's team related, uh, financing related, time related, like how, how do you kind of motivate yourself? I don't know if you know the story about the, the hero characters at Lamsa, but they're basically uh, inspired by my own kids, Judy and Adam. So if you look at the Lamsa logo and, and all the content, You'll see, uh, 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 you know, a, a two characters, hero characters um, that that represent a boy and a girl, and they're inspired by my own kids. Um, so I I really started Lamsa because I, you know, I I really wanted to enable my own children to reach their full potential, and I really believe uh, that education changes lives. And so I I I'm so passionate to a point where. I, I created uh, the Lamsa world around and inspired by my own kids. Uh, I knew at that time that it will suck my time and energy. And so I wanted to have a piece of my kids with me everywhere I go. <laughs> um, so it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, the kids like it that, you know, the, the, the characters represent them, but it also, you know, gives me um, some, you know, confidence when I, you know, I travel a lot and I spend a lot of time at work that it reminds me of why I'm doing what I'm doing. Right. Um, Judy and Adam are at the heart of this. And then so are, you know, millions of kids around the world. Um, I would say the biggest challenge is, is, you know, time. Um, There doesn't seem to be enough time. And I think if you speak to other startups uh, and founders, Time is is one of the rarest, um, you know, assets that we have, and and you know we just need to utilize our time in the most effective manner. Um, and so, yes, uh, developing Lamsa um, had me spend hours and hours uh, and days and months, uh, you know, being uh, really busy, and until today. Um, so that's the biggest challenge I would say is, is just, you know, kids growing up, you're not being able to spend as much time as, as, as you want to, to be around family and loved ones. But then when, when you're so passionate and believe in what you're doing, I think you're able to justify it to yourself that you're working on something that's so impactful. And, uh, and so you try to create these, uh, bonding moments so I've, the way I dealt with it is I'd rather spend uh, quality time than quantity of, of certain time. So I make sure I drop my kids to school every morning. And, and so we can, you know, build up for an awesome day uh, very early on. Um, if I'm in town, I, I make sure we, we have proper dinner together. So it's those, you know, half an hour in the morning, maybe half an hour in the evening or so. These are the moments that, that really count uh in my life and the second thing is building uh, a a strong uh, leadership team it's one of the most important things uh that that any founder needs to do and so uh, it doesn't come easily you have to experiment you have to uh try working with so many different people until you get to the right leadership team the foundational team that that you can bring in as co-founders and 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 so throughout that journey um you will get hurt right um and you will hurt others to be fair um so it's two ways um just like any other relationship whether it's personal or work we as humans we're very complex you know 
uh, in a bundle of emotions and complexities and and uh, insecurities. Each one of us brings that to to the work environment in in certain ways and and shapes and forms. And I think that's one of the hardest things is 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 uh, to develop a core team that. Uh, works really well with each other, that trusts each other, that believes in what you're doing. And along the way, uh, you will get hurt. I did get hurt. And and I'm sure that I cause pain to others. And it's just the natural evolution of relationships. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the main challenges uh, that we have to live up with or live with as entrepreneurs. Uh, the third, maybe, and last uh, uh, point that I'm going to focus on is uh, funding. So funding um, is not easy. I mean, uh, most people watch uh, the Forbes magazine or the newspaper or the PR, and they see us uh, entrepreneurs smiling <laughs> and, you know, next to, uh, you know, our logos or our founders and co-founders. But honestly, um, it takes a few months for every fundraise, if not longer. And uh, along the way, uh, you get so many uh, no's, uh, so many rejections. Um, sometimes uh, investors explain and give you objective uh, criticism and feedback and comments, and sometimes they don't. Uh, so we have to live with all of that and just keep smiling, keep pushing forward. And I think just to summarize and bring all these points together, um, as, as the founders, I don't know if other founders agree, but at least for me, uh, I find myself and my energy impacting the rest of, of the leadership, the rest of the teams. So every morning I have to, uh, you know, really align my energy before I walk in the office um, around midday, I have to do the same <laughs> before I leave. I have to do the same. So, uh, you know, I, I am a very energetic person, uh, for those that don't, uh, that know me, uh, with all of my energy and all of my positivity, I still have to do that alignment at least three times a day. You see, we work with so much uncertainty. We work with, um, you know, so many unknowns around us, so many moving pieces that we don't necessarily control. And so no matter how strong you are, no matter how confident you are, no matter how much support you've got, it will still hit you at least once or twice or three times or maybe 10 times a day, right? The, uh, from my experience, uh, you know, you just got to align, even if it means each one of us has their own way of aligning. Uh, but I'm sure even if we don't admit it, uh, we, we must align more than once a day. Uh, to keep our teams uh, aligned and focused on the objectives. That is such a powerful and incredible point. It's just pure gold. So for those who are listening, that piece of realigning throughout the day and multiple times a day, and especially in the morning is so important. I feel like even for me, I do that in the morning. And I think even just midday, you can get lost in, you know, kind of the trivialities of um, small things or even just the trivialties of big things, but then you sort of lose the focus of the present moment, which makes it impossible to be productive. So I really, really love that point. I love all the points that you've made um, in terms of leadership. I know that we've had a lot of guests talk about how finding the right leadership team is absolutely critical. And if that means making the difficult decisions of letting people go, that is just par for the course. And also quality time, spending quality time with your uh, children and your family is absolutely important. It's not the quantity because a lot of times parents are, you know, around, but they're not actually there, you know, they're on their phone, their computer. So I just, I love the idea of having like specific blocks of time and being really present. So 
I love all those points. I think it's incredibly important, um, especially the alignment piece and being the inspiration and motivator. So thank you for sharing that. Better, we're actually um, coming to time, but I have so many questions for you. Um, so I'll just uh, ask one more. Um, what is a book that you're reading now that has inspired you? I'm sure that as someone who is in the education space, there's probably a lot of books that you've read that have probably kind of nudged you or helped you or inspired you on your own path. But is there a book, it doesn't have to be a book that you're reading at this moment, but maybe one that has stuck out in your mind that you could share with the audience. It, it depends. You want me to, uh, the, the child in me will tell you all of Eric Carle's books, uh, <laughs> starting with The Hungry Caterpillar, <laughs> The Very Hungry Caterpillar. And the list is very long. Uh, but from a from a kind of a business startup perspective, uh, I, I categorize my you know I have two buckets of of reading. One is in the domain you know that we operate in, so early childhood development, and and the brain uh, architecture of kids and how things develop. So I would you know one of my uh, uh, you know, reference books is the whole brain child. And I recommend this for every parent out there. Um, so that's, that's when it comes to the subject matter experience. Um, and we keep educating ourselves in, in this field, um, just, just to understand how, how we work with our, our beautiful minds. You see every day, we also learn from children, so I've got a, as much as the books tell us, uh, interacting with children is so amazing. The other day I, I was in the car with my four-year-old um, nephew and and you know I was driving him to school and I said, uh, Laith, I said, uh, school is cool. He said, no, I'm a school is a tool. I said, tool for what? And he's four years old, Yasmin. He said, uh, to fix my brain. And I said, fix your brain for what? He's like, to give me all the knowledge. I said, what are you going to do with the knowledge? He said, I'm going to fix all the problems in the world. And I was like, oh, wow, this is, you know, I don't need to read a book anymore today. You know, that's, that's what was my reading for the day. Um, the other uh, uh, book that I, I, I recently started reading is uh, by Deepak Chopra. And he gifted me this book uh, last year or pre-COVID, but I only got a chance to come to it uh, the last few weeks. It's called The Metahuman and uh, discusses infinite potential of humans and unlocking that. And maybe uh, the third one that I really enjoy and refer to by, uh, all the time is uh, Nassim Talib's book, uh, Anti-Fragile, just helps me stay <laughs> aligned. <laughs> and uh, I, yeah, I like the concept of anti-fragility. Mm, love all of those recommendations. And I love, uh, you know, spending time with children because I do agree. I think they're so insightful and can just share so much knowledge with us. And um, I also, I can't believe that you met Deepak Chopra. I am a big fan of his. And I do think that a lot of things start in the the non-physical and then move to the physical. So I think that's super important. And I also met Nassim Talib at um, Columbia Business School. Oh, wow. I'm jealous now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll introduce um, you to Deepak if you introduce me to Nassim. <laughs> I, don't, he, I don't think he remembers me at all. Um, so, but we briefly uh, encountered at Columbia Business School um, when he spoke there over 10 years ago. So now I'm aging myself. But Awesome. <laughs> uh, well, Badger, thank you so much for your time. I could talk to you all day. I think that you have a wealth of knowledge and it's so fascinating to hear your story. I'm sure that there are so many people that are inspired with what you've built and what you're doing. So are there any resources that you can point folks to in order to learn more about you um, and LEMSA? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we welcome anyone interested in the space to check out uh, lemsaworld.com. But I want to leave you with a, with just a thought. So um, you know how the saying that we all know it says it takes a village to raise a child. I I, I still believe that that's still valid. Uh, but we've you know with the movement to the cities and the urban life, we've lost the village, right? Um, but I think we all as adults have a big responsibility towards children around us. Um, and we we should not focus on, on, on the importance of early childhood development. So I do encourage every parent out there, um, every adult that interacts with kids, you know, those first eight years that these are the formative years, do as much as you can 
uh, be that village for 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 that child around you and let's you know let's change lives and let's unleash human potential and 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 allow these beautiful minds to 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 be the most creative innovative um human beings to to change uh the world that we live in to to a more positive one mm, wow so inspiring and that's just a mic drop moment i have nothing more to add <laughs> and thank, thank you, you for having me Yasmin. thank you so much thank you and for our audience thanks for joining and for listening to startup confessionals